we go. Good evening, everybody. How is everybody tonight? It is, oh look, it's wine o'clock. It's going to be wine o'clock for the next 60 minutes, as I say at the top of the hour. Uh, tonight, I am not drinking wine. I am drinking, you know what, I'll let you guess. I'll let you guys guess. Hey, I'll tell you. It's Irish night. Tullamore du whiskey. And it's good. It's got a good little blend. Um, let's see. I'm just sharing this page away. Hey, if you're new to the page um, and you're not on Wine with Dave and you want to leave a comment, it'll show up on the screen. So just go to Wine with Dave and you'll be able to leave a comment, show up on the screen. But type in uh, where you're from. I'm really curious where you are from. we got a bunch of people. Whoa, lots of people watching. That's cool. I'm Dave England. This is Wine with Dave. It's a show that started on April 1st, and the goal is to build up local businesses, authors, creative people, musicians, and podcasters. That's right. And tonight, I've got a really awesome up-and-coming podcaster. She is going to blow your mind away. She's awesome. She's very inspiring. Uh, so leave a comment. What do we have? Who do we have here tonight? We got road trip. Thir Rick's on a road trip. California is listening. Road trip. Where are you? What road trip are you? Deb Burton's <laughs> mead. You're drinking mead. I think you're drinking mead. Deb, I actually, speaking of mead, I might have a guest who actually makes their own mead coming up in a few weeks. Courtney, good evening, Dave. Good evening, Courtney. I hope you're not working tonight. Please say you got the night off. Please, please. I want you to have the night off so you can watch the whole show. Wes Warwick, awesome. That's good whiskey. Mmm, that's good whiskey. Hey, welcome to the show. Tonight is going to be really awesome. I've got some added dimensions, some added dimensions to the show. Um... So it's going to be fun. Uh, you are working tonight. Oh, bummer. Bummer. But, you know, let me know how, how much of the show you watch. Ten minutes? Half an hour? I'm always worried. You're always worried. I know. I'm worried for you, too. You're on the front lines, girl. You're on the front lines. Hey, uh, it is episode 61, Wine with Dave. Got a couple segments, and we're going to get right into the first segment right now. We're going to start with our first segment. It's called, Did You Know? I love Did You Know. I think a lot of you like Did You Know. Did You Know is all about odd facts, strange, strange phenomenons that you didn't know took place. Are you ready? Let me turn this down. It's a little, little on the loud. Did you know... That in 1963, the Major League Baseball pitcher Gaylord Perry remarked, and these are his words, check this out, they'll put a man on the moon before I hit a home run. Keep in mind, he's a pitcher. Pitchers don't even get hits. They don't even get singles or doubles, let alone a home run. Gaylord Perry, pitcher, okay? Keep that in mind. They'll put a man on the moon before I hit a home run. On July 20th, 1969, an hour, one hour after Neil Armstrong set foot on the surface of the moon, guess what happened? Gaylord Perry hit his first and only home run while playing for the San Francisco Giants. Is that crazy? He just flippantly said, they'll put a man on the moon before he hit a home run. Neil Armstrong gets on the moon an hour later, crack out of the park. A pitcher. I bet you didn't know that. Tell me if you think that was cool, huh? Deb Burton, Tullamore Dew is indeed good whiskey. You better believe it, especially tonight. Did you know that according to Genesis chapter 1 in the Bible, verses 20 through 22, the chicken did come before the egg? 
I answered that question. Everyone wondered what came first, the chicken or the egg? According to the Bible in chap- Genesis chapter 1, 20 to 22, the chicken came before the egg. Look it up. Did you know that dueling is legal in Paraguay? Yep, as long as both parties are registered blood donors, you can go ahead and duel. All Major League Baseball umpires must wear black underwear while on the job in case their pants split. Did you know that? Black underwear. I imagine the umpire's mom telling him as he's getting ready for work, Jerry, do you have your black underwear on? Yeah, ma. Uh, In space, this is interesting, astronauts cannot cry because there's no gravity and tears cannot flow. You can't cry in space. That'd be a great place to break up up with a girlfriend, huh? Girlfriend texts you in space. I know, honey, I know you're at the uh, the space station, but I'm done with you. I'm I'm going, I'm gonna be with Jerry now. And then you just don't cry, because you just can't, you just can't cry. Even though Jerry's a better pick, I don't know. I digress. Leonardo da Vinci invented scissors. Did you know that? What do you think of that? Come on, leave some comments. I think those are really cool things. Did you know that the cigarette lighter was invented before the match? That's crazy. Before the match. Did you know men read smaller print than women? But women can hear better. Okay, I got one, two, three, four. I got five interactive questions. I want you to leave your comments. What common spice is extremely poisonous if injected intravenously? Think about that. Here's the next one. There are over what number Americans on waiting lists for organ transplants? How many Americans are waiting for an organ transplant? Just put Americans organ transplant and just put spice in what the spice is which if you inject it intravenously is very poisonous it will shock you I guarantee you the average lifespan of a major league baseball not baseball player the average lifespan of an average baseball is how long Babe Ruth wore this item under his cap to keep his head cool he changed it every two innings And lastly, babies are born without what? And these things appear between the ages of two and four. Okay, that wraps up. Did you know? And we're going to add up all of the the answers you guys have. So go ahead and leave your answers. Um, What spice is extremely poisonous if injected intravenously? What do you think it is? My guest is in the green room, and she just said cinnamon. And guess what? She's wrong. (laughs) You can't hear her. She's laughing, but she's wrong. But that's good. It's a good guess. Anybody else? Nobody's guessing. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh, Deb Burton thinks it's anise. Ooh. Uh, No, that's wrong, too. She also said American, uh, okay, there are over how many Americans on a waiting list for organ transplants? Well, I'm going I'm to say the first answer, okay? Nutmeg. Nutmeg is extremely poisonous if injected intravenously. Do not inject nutmeg in your body. You will be no longer watching Wine with Dave. All right, how many Americans are on a waiting list for organ transplants? Anybody? Deb Burton says 100,000 Americans. You are really close, and you would know this. You are very close. It's actually 87,000 Americans are on the waiting list. 87,000. Although that fact might be old, so it could be 90. You could be close. You could be accurate. You might be a winner, Deb. 
The average lifespan of a major league baseball. How long does an average lifespan of an American League National League uh, Major League Baseball last? Anybody? Anyone want to guess that thing? Seven pitches. Yep. They throw it seven times. Boom. That's it. They retire it. Imagine that. Uh, Babe Ruth wore this under his cap to keep his head cool, and he changed it every two innings. This is going to shock you. Anybody know? Just type in Babe Ruth and what you think he put under his hat. And lastly, babies are born without this thing. It's a certain thing. It's in their body. And they appear between the ages of two and four. Anybody? I've got no one guessing. No one's guessing. No one's guessing. Come on. Come on, people. I'll hang in there for a little bit. Babe Ruth wore this under his cap to keep his head cool. He changed it every two innings. Just type in Babe Ruth and what you think it is. And actually, if you want to guess and you're not on this page, you have to be on the Wine with Dave Facebook page. And there's the live feed. Just go there, leave a comment, and you could win some big prizes. I'm giving away some big prizes. Like my old pair of glasses. You might get the old pair of glasses. Or possibly, even better, a 9-volt battery. Yes, I do not mess around. All right, no one's, no one's voting. Let's see. Let's see. Want me to tell you? All right. Babe Ruth wore a cabbage leaf. A cabbage leaf under his cap to keep his head cool. He changed it every two innings. Imagine that. He lifted it up, pulled out the cabbage leaf, and just threw it away. All right, babies are born without kneecaps. Yeah, kneecaps. Kneecaps in children only appear between the ages of two and four. Is that weird? That's weird. I did not know that. All right, guess what today is? August 27th. Moving on to the next segment. This is good. This is good. Uh, let me get some things lined up here. I got some things. Okay. Uh, where are we? Where are we at? Where are we at? August 27th. You know what happened on August 27th? Well, this happened right there. Boom. Boom. Today, record the shortest recorded war in the history happened today in 1896. Britain defeated Zanzibar. It was a 38 minute war. It went from 9.02 a.m. to 9.40 a.m. The shortest war ever recorded in the history, the history of wars was today, 1896. Britain defeats Zanzibar, that little island off the coast of Africa, right? Off the east coast of Africa. Zanzibar, it's a long, skinny island. It looks like a cigar. It's off the coast of Africa, I believe. Or is it India? No, I think it's Africa. Look it up. Someone look it up. It lasted 38 minutes. Is that crazy? That was crazy. That was today. That was today. Got some sad news. Today this happened. Oh my gosh. I remember this. This was pretty sad. Today, Stevie Ray Vaughan died in 1990. What's that? Uh, to 30 years ago today, wow, 30 years, he was killed when the helicopter he was flying in hit a man-made ski slope while trying to navigate through dense fog. Oh, man, I should not be drinking whiskey. It was trying to navigate through dense fog. I know exactly where I was when I heard this. Vaughn had played a show at Alpine Valley Music Theater, East Troy, Wisconsin, with Robert Cray and Eric Clapton. All right, check this out. Vaughn was informed by a member of Clapton's crew that three seats were open on the helicopter returning back to Chicago. So uh, it turned out that there was only one seat, and Vaughn requested it from his brother, Okay, Jimmy Vaughn, another famous guitar player, his brother, who inspired him to play guitar, by the way. He was on the plane. He would have died. Jimmy Vaughn would have died. 
Jimmy said, all right, I'll give it up. Yeah, you, you can go back to Chicago. I'll hang back with Eric Clapton. Um, so Eric Clapton did not go, but a few of his entourage, three members of Eric Clapton's entourage, went on that helicopter with Stevie Ray Vaughan, and it crashed. And, oh my gosh, we lost a blues god, if you want to call him that. The tone, this poor guy, oh my gosh. I can't even keep that up. That was that was rough. That was bad news. Uh, you want more bad news? Tonight's all about bad news. This happened. Brian Epstein, British music entrepreneur and manager of the Beatles, was found dead today, 1967, locked in a bedroom at his London home. A coroner's inquest concluded that Epstein died from an overdose of the sleeping pill Carbitrol. So it was an accident. Uh, imagine that. He, he started managing them in 63, I think. Maybe 62, probably 63, 64. And he only lasted three years. But man, did he, he picked a band. You want to talk about managing a band? <laughs> I think these boys went places. Too sad. Brian Epstein died today. 1967. Crazy, huh? Um, Mike England, love. Hey, my brother Mike's on the call. Mike, I know. Stevie Ray Vaughan, so sad. Brian, imagine that. Stevie Ray Vaughan died the same day that Brian Epstein died. I did not know that. Did not know that. You want some more bad news? I got a lot of bad news. No, um... I don't, I don't have any more bad news. I want to end it on an up note. Ready? And what better up note than Mary Poppins? Walt Disney's Mary Poppins starring Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke premiered in Los Angeles today in 1964. That's cool, huh? Am I blurry? I'm moving. I'm blurry. I shouldn't be blurry. I should pull this back so I'm not blurry. Uh, yeah, I, I like to end in an up note. Uh, Brian Epstein died. Stevie Ray Vaughan died. But Mary Poppins premiered. <laughs> That's cool, huh? Uh, enough of that. I'm going to get to my guest in a couple seconds here. But uh, I want to tell you about next Thursday. I'm taking next Thursday off. It's kind of rare. But I am taking next Thursday off because my cousin Jamie and I formed a rock duo, and I think I have an image of it. Check this out. We are called Irlandica, kind of like Ireland meets America, Irlandica. We're two guitars and a drum machine, and we're playing next Friday night. First time I played out in a very long time. We got a good gig right by the water, Edgewood Yacht Club, and uh, we need next Thursday to rehearse one more night before... Friday and um, and so we're really looking forward to it. We're doing a lot of 70s pop hits. Think AM radio, summertime. If you want it, here it is. Come and get it. But you better hurry because it's going fast. Yeah, Baby Blue, come on. All these hits, ELO, Black Magic Woman, all these all these pop rock hits in the 70s. Yep. It's actually a private event and uh, it's members only, so you can't really go. But I'm thinking, I'm considering, and leave a comment, I'm thinking of going live with it. Just thinking about it. I don't know if I'm going to put it on my personal page or Wine with Dave, but I'll think, I'll think it through. If you want to see us live for the very first time, it's our debut, let me know. I would like to know if you want to see that. All right. Let's get into this. Cue, cue this. Tonight, you guys are in for a treat. Oh, it's 9.19. Running a little late, but we're going to go late with her. Um, so I'm taking the week off next week, but tonight you're in for a treat. My guest is Tiffany Moore Borgelin. She is the host of Pure Voice Podcast, and uh, she's super cool. And, if, and I want you to follow her podcast because... She's got a lot of wisdom. She's a mom. 
she's an entrepreneur. She's great. Once you hear her voice, you feel like you're you're like your best friend. And uh, I want you to follow her. And she's on right after this video. So hang in there. Check this out. Imagine someone kind of just closing their eyes and plugging up their ears and going, ah, da, 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 I can't hear you, I can't hear you, I can't hear you, even whenever they're getting all the warning signs and symptoms and all those precursors to show you what is coming down the road. And they put their blinders on and they plug their ears because that way they can be blissfully ignorant. Yeah, it's great that you can you know, get other people excited about your ideas, but always have something to show and prove that you've been working you've got something going instead of offering guidance and resources we offer authoritarian mandates and then we wonder why our grown children have a hard time saying no to people fight with your voice you open your mouth and you say this is wrong this is not right at some point all of us are called to the front lines the front lines aren't always what you think they are when you hear someone crying out near you for help and assistance and you see that they're being wronged, well, honey, you're on the front lines in that moment. Hey, Tiffany, how are you? Hey, Dave, I'm great. I'm great. <laughs> you're on the, the front lines aren't what you think they are. That was from the video. That's that's awesome. You are very inspirational, listening to your podcast, very inspirational. Have you always been that way, even as a little girl? You know what? I'm told that I have been, although I don't. I have not always seen myself as that way. So, um, yep. you know, I, I guess I guess I am. I, if enough people are saying it, then I, I'm going to go with that. Yeah. You're going to go with it, yeah. <laughs> now, you just told me about 10 minutes before we went live that you're actually an introvert. You, I, I got to ask this right away. How in the world does an introvert start a podcast? You know what? I think that if if there's going to be any type of broadcasting or you know getting yourself out there, um, and I this is a this is almost a dog whistle to my fellow introverts out there, but I think podcasting is the way to go for that because um, for me, when I started, uh, I needed to do it in such a way that I could remain introverted. There were so many opportunities to go to local studios and produce a podcast. You know, people were in my inbox saying, you know, Hey, you can start your own podcast, you know, um, you know, this work, this work, what do you call it? Workspace or, you know, those, um, those places where you go and you work and it's kind of like a communal type situation. We work and all of that, you know, we have a podcasting studio, come and do your podcast. And while I was very interested in getting my voice out there, because I do feel like I have something to share, I was not interested in being in an environment with so much other energy and then also having to put myself on someone's schedule. So what I did in order to accommodate that part of me that is an introvert to do a podcast was I just learned podcasting from the ground up, you know, all of the technology involved. And I created the studio right here in my home. So that way I get to reach out um, talk to amazing people, um, share whatever wisdom I feel like I may have that can help my fellow human being. I heard of my own home, I'm going to venture out. So that's how the introvert was able to do the podcast. <laughs> you know, that makes sense. That's, that's awesome. So now on your podcast show, it's called Pure Voice, and I'm asking everyone out there to please subscribe to Pure Voice with Tiffany Moore Borgelin. Her name is right below her, so you can see it. And, uh, you know, any podcaster is, like, dying for followers. So uh, she's not someone that begs. I, I know a little, little about you. I know that you're not like that. But I do know that it's all about getting listenership. So please, the goal of Wine with Dave is to, is to really lift up local businesses and creative entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and stuff. Please follow her. Just go to iTunes. It's really easy. Search for her. Uh, look for her album art. You know, Pure Voice. You'll see it. Pure Voice. Click it. Follow. Just subscribe. Okay? Please do that. Uh, so, you're billing yourself as a holistic voice coach. What is that? Well, a holistic voice coach, that's something, I was actually one of the first people in the United States that started using that terminology. Now more people are using it, but I started probably back in the late 90s, 
early 2000s. And really what it is, is I am a voice coach in the traditional sense, like a vocal coach. I work with um, different individuals, professionals, um, people who are semi-professional when it comes to singing, acting, um, you know, and all of that. But moreover, I'm a holistic voice coach because I, I'm non-traditional in that I take, take account of the whole person, spirit, mind, and body. And so often when you think of a vocal coach or a voice coach, you think of someone who's sitting at a piano, running you up and down the scale, saying, you know, project, yeah. project. Um, and what happened over time with me was I began to realize that because of my own life experiences, I was being very empathetic towards my clients and being able to see them not just as a voice, but as a whole person. And so there were times when my clients would come into the studio and we would get right to the music, we'd get right to the song, we'd get right to the monologue. Then there were other times I started to realize they came in and the whole, the whole time we were together, it, they might be crying and talking about things that have happened in their past that make them fearful. And I started to realize, you know what? Voice is so much bigger than just singing a song or doing a monologue or doing a spoken word piece. Um, and so it kind of evolved. I evolved into that more than anything, uh, but I evolved very quickly into that. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a holistic voice coach. Uh, there are days that my clients come and they, they book a session to learn a song. And then there are days they book a session for life coaching um, that goes along with helping them to manage themselves as artists. Mm -hmm. so, and then there are days where there's a plan and the plan is not followed because someone might come in and collapse in tears because of something that's going on or because of something that they've been triggered as a result of. And we know in that moment, we're not going to get through this song today. Let's talk about it. Let's get into this. Let's, let's see what's going on so we can get you back on track to be what you're wanting to be, to be what you've come to me to be. So wow. on any given day, you know, it can be, it's a little bit of life coaching. It's a little bit of voice coaching, a little bit of everything, you know. So is it is it all singers or is it voiceover artists or is it mostly singers that you um, work it's, with? It's, I, it runs the gamut. I work with singers. I work with it. I've I've worked with Grammy winners. I've worked with just school teachers who want to learn how to sing better so they can work with their their children. Um, I work today. I got a call from a, a woman who wants to do better in her corporate meetings. She's nervous about the way she's uh, presenting herself. So she wanted me to work with her coming up. She wants me to work with her on overcoming fear so that she can present better in her meeting. So it can be wow. anyone. I've worked with poets. Um, I've worked with therapists, um, believe it or not, who themselves, while they are actually um, called to, if you will, helping other people, they still struggle in some ways with things in their own lives when it comes to voice and making sure that they're being um, true to themselves. So, you know, it just runs the gamut, really. So they're inside the box, so they need someone that's outside to kind of guide them through that, whatever they're going through. Right, right. And you're located in North Carolina? Yeah, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been in the South all my life, uh, so it's pretty much the area that I know. So, but I, I'm, while I'm located in the South Carolina, my clients are all over the country. Um, uh, before, even before the pandemic, um, I would have some clients who would uh, do virtual sessions. I have uh, clients uh, on the West Coast. I have clients in Boston. I have clients um, in different places that can't make it to the studio. Um, right. So if it's conducive to doing virtual, then we de definitely do the work here. Right. You know, you and, and this is not for you, Tiffany, but it's for everyone out there listening. Please follow her podcast. It's great. I mean, just listen to it. How long are they typically? Like Thirty minutes, forty-five minutes? Um, right at th they average thirty minutes. I think I have two that have gotten into the fifty-five-zero minute cat category, yeah. but for the most part, um, they average uh, around thirty minutes, twenty-seven minutes, eighteen minutes. If you did an average of all of them, you'd probably come up right at thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, I, you learn a lot, and you've got one on Oprah. You had a dream about Oprah Winfrey, which is. <laughs> Pretty crazy. I do want to get to that, so hold me to it. That was so detailed. I can't believe that. So what types of people seek out a holistic voice coach? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's those individuals. That I named the, type, the different like professions that come, but the thing that they have in common is that 
regardless of what they're doing, it's individuals who just want to break out of the box. They want to stop being afraid. They want to realize what it is that possibly, whether it's trauma, whether it's uh, whatever it is that may be holding them back. And also people who just want to be unapologetic. You know, coming out of the box sometimes just sets you up to, to just pursue what it is that you want to pursue. But mm -hmm. they want to be unapologetic in their pursuit and not follow the status quo. Um, because it's, I always, I have a saying, I always say, a really, 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 really big box. So if you come to that wall, you're going to come to that ceiling. It may take you longer because you're in a place that allows you a little bit more freedom. And so you think you're free. When in all actuality, you're still in the box. It's just a really big one. So the goal when I'm working with my clients, whether it's hitting that higher note, whether it's winning this poetry competition, whether it's getting over some sort of traumatic experience that, you know, will now allow them to go out and give voice to whatever it is they're called to do. The goal is to ensure that there's nothing caging you in. And anytime you run up against that, you are able through the work that we do to neutralize it. And if it doesn't want to be neutralized, then we're going to fully destroy it. Because one thing we don't have time to do is waste time. Um, we're here for just a period of time on this earth. And I, my husband gave me a book called, in the title of the book, I wish I could remember the author right off. Um, but the book is called Damn, D-A-M-N, just Damn. That's the whole, that's the whole title of the book. Oh, I wrote that. I wrote that. Oh, did you? You know what? I thought so. I wasn't sure. Damn, um, but, by Dave damn. Ingram. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was years ago. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? It sums up why I do what I do. Because what I don't want to happen is for, because everybody is so worthy and so gifted, what, I, what no one wants to happen is to have a lot of regrets. So the yeah. book, Damn, is literally a collection of letters written by people who have regrets for not going out and accomplishing what they wanted to accomplish. Wow. Um, yeah, and the whole book and it can like some of the some of the people are like there's a there's one I remember specifically about a young lady who got a full scholarship to college about 20 years ago, but she didn't want to leave her boyfriend and she was in kind of an abusive relationship. She, she knew what she wanted to do. She got a full scholarship and then she turned down the scholarship and then she ended up marrying this guy and you know all kinds of drama ensued. And her life took a direction that she didn't want it to take. So that was her big damn. Like, damn, had I just gone on and did what I was supposed to do and went to college. Or the, or the person who, uh, you know, wanted to st do a particular song or write a song. Or, you know, um, even, even my client, even the person today, the, the uh, podcast that I have today that I dropped uh, yesterday, it's called Jamil. And it's a singer. She's a singer that I know very well. And her mother, I knew very well. Her mother passed away about three years ago, and her mom sang with um, some of the greats, Patti LaBelle, Shaka Khan, um, just all these great, oh. um, you know, singers that when you say their name, yeah, it evokes wow, you know. But her mom was a background singer who, in my opinion, because I've heard her sing before, her name could have very well been listed with those names. But her mom, uh, one of the things that we learned through the podcast um, with my client, with uh, the singer, um, Jamil, is she says the things that her mom regrets not doing. And so her mother wow. spent a great part of her life making sure that she instilled in Jamil, please do this because I regret that I didn't take certain opportunities. And yeah, I sang with the greats, but there's always that big what if. So I said all that to say, at the end of the day, my goal um, is to help individuals who seek me out, those people who seek me out, who say, I just want to do what I was called to do. And, and, and I'm, I'm ready to do that work. It's, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm scared, but I'll go shaking, my, shaking in my boots. Let's do this. And so that's, those are the types of individuals that come to me, you know? So Tiffany, how do you know that you've succeeded? Um, would, it, would it be in the way of like, you know, they, they ended up writing a song because you've helped them connect with some emotion and then they end up writing a song and is, is that it? Or how is that? Various ways, for instance, um, I had a young lady who came to me, it was probably about five years ago. It, it's when I see them doing what they're, what they said they came to me to do, whether okay. it's I want to do a one woman show, I want to write a play, I want to write a book. Um, and the beauty, I think one of the most beautiful moments that ever happened for me was um, there was a, a young lady who came to me and she had a, a story she wanted to tell. 
and she wanted to write a book. Her name is Yolanda Bynum, and she wrote the book. It's called uh, A Walk Walk in My Shoes, and um, or Walk of. Uh, her name is Yolanda Bynum, and her book is on um, Amazon. But we can look it up. Rate, yep. Yeah. At any rate, she wrote the book, and um, when she came to me, she was just in a space of needing to be able to express. So. I also prescribed songs, even though she didn't come to me to be a singer, we used voice as a means of opening, opening her up in other ways. When I knew that I succeeded was when I went to her book signing. And the over and above for me, and this is not any type of self worth, was when I opened up the book and it said, oh, I'm getting emotional. It said, this book is dedicated to Tiffany Moore Borgeland. What? Are you serious? Um, I was so humbled, you know, even talking about it right now, I get wow. chilled because it was humbling to me to know that not many uh, months or, you know, maybe a year or two prior, she sat there thinking, I I'm not going to be able to do this. She, she, she shared her story. And then to be sitting there with her in her new office building with her book on display, um, it's the fruition moment. It's the seeing that client get on stage and sing that song that they used to choke up every time they sang, they couldn't get through it. Or, you know, just watching that person do that poem or just seeing that person start working on it. You know, one moment they're like, I would, you know, I've always been told that I was dumb or I couldn't do it or, or you know, my, my, yeah. They, they, they made me go in this direction when I didn't want to go. So now I'm reclaiming who I am. And then they start doing it. And you're just like, you know, wow, and then you get lost in their vision. You start to almost feel like it's you. Like, that's how I am anyway. Like, I'll tell my clients, at some point, this will be my play. So just know that. <laughs> because I'm teaming up with you, and then the excitement, I get so excited. But, but the way that we know that there's success, success you can measure, is when that client begins to show fruit. They don't have to have completed it yet, but they've started to work on it. They bring the manuscript, they bring the song, um, they start writing the play or the song or what have you, or, you know, just anything that, that there's fruit. It doesn't have to be full fruition because I get it. We're all at different spaces and places. Right. When the fruit starts to grow when you see that, that the little bud and then you see a little tiny, you know, green apple. And then I'm, I celebrate every single moment as a success when we're making, pro you know, progress you can measure. Yeah. Wow. You're like, you're like a creative midwife. <laughs> you know what? I like that. Creative midwife. There's I mean, that's what you are, right? <laughs> I mean, you're you're helping birth this like new chapter in their life, and you've just you've brought that to fruition. So, how did you feel when you open up the book and you see this is dedicated to Tiffany Moore Porcelain? <laughs> you must have said, uh, "Yeah, I like what I do." <laughs> um, I was overwhelmed and I was humbled. Um. I'm, I'm a very much a background person, coaching of any kind, uh, for the most part, even vocal coaching. I am um, I'm the in-house vocal, uh, vo vocal coach for On Cue Productions, which is the um, premier black theater company here, African-American theater company in the Charlotte region. And for a while, we were the only um, African-American theater company that did a full uh, season of, of, of theater, uh, professional theater. Um, dedicated to the black experience, especially that of the African American. Yep. And me sitting in the audience and watching the plays go forth, being able to team up with the director and the actors, when I see the play go off and I know that that character that's up there that had that struggle with that note or that line, and we, we sat in the wings and we worked through it. Or whether it's, like I said, with um, the, the young lady who wrote the book, uh, Yolanda Bynum, whether it's her or anyone else, um, I, I become overwhelmed and I'm, I get humbled and um, as, as assertive as I am or come across, I can be a little shy, but not shy so much as that introversion kicks in and I start to feel uncomfortable even sometimes in that energy, believe it or not. Um, mm -hmm. But it's more humbling than anything. Um, it's more humbling than anything. Wow. So who inspires you? You know what, Dave? The per the and this is going to sound so corny. Oh my God! It's going to sound so corny for me to say this. Go for if it. I'm I'm could, the king of corny. Okay, so if you could take all of the people, um, the people that that have worked that have allowed me to work with them, because it's a privilege they allowed me to work with them, 
If right. you took those individuals and then you then you put in my friends, my very small uh, circle of warrior friends, and you know you created and, and Mike, you created this big transformer. Uh, I guess is you know the movie Transformers or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Put them all all the parts. Yes, all of them together. That's my inspiration. That's where I thrive, and, and and because everyone who does it, they sometimes they'll tell me, well, I look up to you or I admire you and thank you, but I tell them thank you for allowing me in your process because a lot of times when I'm speaking to my clients, I'm also talking to myself, and they get through things quite honestly that I don't even know. I we all talk a big game, you know. I'm when I when I'm helping, I'm not helping from a place of. Um, having already just mastered it myself, I'm helping from a place of a desire to, to see them master it. And so when I see them break through and they do all these things, um, I'm inspired by them. And some of my clients, some of them don't even know, they they mentored me because of their, um, what do you call it? Because of their uh, stick to because of their uh, endurance. And there have been times that I've literally been in their face going, you can do it, you can do it. And in the back of my own mind, I'm like, wow, you know, I know this has got to be a hard one. I'm going to, you know, and so when they do right, it, right. it's not that I didn't believe they could, but I'm more inspired then. <laughs> so, but it's got to take a level of selflessness to say, you know what, I don't, I don't care that I'm not the singer. I, I want them to be a great singer. I want them to be the, the star. Right? I mean, that comes natural to you? You know what? When I was 12 years old, I was in the living room uh, with my best friend. And at the time, her father was the main DJ in Greenville, South Carolina, at a radio station called WHYZ. That was the big R&B radio, radio station. And he was Mike the Burner Williams in Greenville, South Carolina. I'll never forget <laughs> this. Mike and, the Burner uh, Williams. Mike the Burner Williams. He was the man in Greenville, South Carolina on the radio. And, yep. but it just so happened that she, his daughter was my best friend. And I, and I came into the house one day and she and I were in the kitchen and we were singing and I was singing. She, cause I sang, I'm a singer too. And we were in the kitchen and I started to sing, I think somewhere over the rainbow or something. Little did I know that he had a music that, that, that her father was in the living room. And that there was a music producer out of Atlanta in there with him. I had no clue or I would not started to sing all loudly and boldly in there with her. And then I get a phone call later that night and my friend says, my dad wants to see you and your parents. So we meet with them and it turns out the, the producer heard me in there singing and wanted me to, um, wanted to work with me. He wanted to, um, you know, produce me. And he had an in in the industry so they started to pay for me to get vocal coaching. They wrote me songs. Wow. Breathing coaching and all of this. And I did not care for that. <laughs> um, no. I didn't care for that. I just liked singing. Like I sang in pageants and, you know, I sang in choirs and I sang for fun and, um, and for theater and things like that. But I didn't care for the structure of, of doing all of that. And so I started to slack. You know, even though they were putting all this money into me and I was supposed to be, you know, they actually wanted me to redo the song um, Dancing in the Streets by Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. Oh, yeah. That was supposed to be what I was. That was going to be the thing that I was going to do. And they also wrote me original music. My parents were very upset because I didn't follow through, but I just didn't care for the energy surrounding getting out there and singing for for what? For me, it was like unless there has some there's there's some purpose or message in it. I just it didn't appeal to me. And, and um, but what did appeal to me was when I became a choir director by the time I was 20 at my old church long time ago. And I started to see people say, I can't hit the note or, you know, this is hard. And something just kind of woke up on the inside of me. And that's when I knew I'm probably supposed to be a good singer so that I can also be a coach. And so I started coaching people like, you know, in my early 20s, just out of the blue, um, just helping them through. So when you ask me that, when I want people to go forth and it's not my thing, I'm, it just doesn't appeal to me. It just never has. Um, mm. unless, unless it's like singing at someone's funeral 
or singing a song to comfort someone or right. singing a love song or a song to my son um, or singing a song that, that someone, I, you know, they, they're in need of comfort or healing or whatever, that, that appeals to me. But the, all the other stuff, I just, I don't, it's never just been me, you know. I can't even, I can't manufacture it. It's not me, you know. That's interesting. I mean, the gen, you know, the general, when you look at different industries and different jobs and you think of singers, singers are, they, they have a job and they're, they get into the role of the lyrics, what, what is, what's going on in the mind of the songwriter so they can convey it, unless they wrote the lyrics. Um, that used to be back in the day, you just, you write a song, you sing it. But now I'm seeing a lot of this. I'm seeing a lot of people doing specific jobs that are so finite and so um, so individual. They're so unique to a generic industry. Like what you're doing, you're helping songwriters really connect with what they're feeling at the time and helping them holistically. Which you that 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 you're. Your industry did not exist 10 years ago, even probably five years ago, right? Well, no, not to the degree that people knew to call it a holistic voice coach. Yeah. Uh, if anything, you know, people were kind of piecemealing a title of something together that they thought they knew about. And, you know, I think, too, um, the reason that, that it's so important to have a coach that addresses the entire person is because art whether you're singing any type of vocal art, any type of art overall, but because this is my specialty, vocal art, and um, and also just helping people to realize their voice, whether it's just learning how to speak up for yourself um, and those kinds of things, it's medicinal. I always tell my clients, you know, you have medicine in you, and all of us have a particular medicine in us. And you know, it's like you said, I'm 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 wanting to help draw that out of you. Even someone like yourself, you providing this platform, that's part of your medicine. That's what you were sent here to do. We're all medicine men and medicine women, but we have to tap into our particular medicine that we were brought here to leave for individuals or to help people with. And that's mine, helping them to tap there into you go. the voice, you know? That's awesome. So someone made a comment, uh, and actually anybody out there, just you know, leave a comment if you want to ask uh, Tiffany a question. Daya just said, very good que uh, guest tonight, Dave. Her work sounds... Oop, I just lost it. Uh, her work sounds a lot like some of what I do. We'll certainly follow Tiffany. So he's going to follow you. He's a, he is uh, awesome. a vocal coach. He's also a voiceover artist. And he's from the Caribbean. And I do Excellent. know what little I know of him. He's actually going to be on the show in September. I think it's September. And... Um, okay. So one of one of his agents, I think, says you need to come back to America because there's a need for island sounding voices, uh, oh. masculine. Deep. He's got that deep James Earl Jones voice. So anyway, he does a lot of voiceover, Burger King, big brands too. So he's really really good. He'll be on the show in a few weeks, uh, but he's going to follow you, which is pretty cool. Awesome, um, Be sure to follow you back. Daya, yeah, I'll, I'll shoot you. Daya Otley, O T T L E Y. So Daya, if you're if you're still watching, just you know, type in a comment. Um, what else did I have? Pandemic. The pandemic that hit us. This thing called COVID nineteen. When are we going to be done with this stupid thing? You know, uh, how has that affected you? Um, because of the type of coaching that I do, it was very easy just to transfer everything online. Um, I miss my clients, their, you know, their individual energy, but I knew that I immediately needed to close everything down. Um, I, I think you can still hear me. You're frozen. I'm I hear frozen, you. Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Um, it was easy just to move everything online. And because probably about 20% of my clientele, because they're all over the United States was already online. Mm -hmm. We just, we just moved everything online. I do miss them coming into the studio. I miss the hugs. I miss the energy of, of seeing them in person. But from a from just a work standpoint, I've been able to. I'm so thankful and grateful. Just continue, and I'm gr grateful that my clients have also. I haven't ha had any major reports of like job loss or anything like that. Um, and I'm you know hoping that that stays the same for them. I did have a couple that had some transitions, 
So from that standpoint, it didn't affect me too, too, too badly. But my heart is for my clients who have lost out on work as a result, because because I work with artists, uh, many of them don't have anywhere to sing right now. They don't mm. the plays were shut down, you know, and all that. And so that's where they're struggling. And I and I feel them because you can feel them wanting so much to express and not having those opportunities. And then from a financial standpoint for some of them as well. But but moreover, it's the it's the hurt and the pain they feel from not being able to be on that stage and express or be behind that microphone or, you know, whatever, whatever it is that they do. Um, and it hurts my heart to see that as well. I, I thought about that the other day, like all these bands that aren't I mean, the Paul McCartney's are all set, right? I mean, they're all, right. they're doing well. There's Paul Simons, you know, the, uh, you name it, Taylor Swift's, they're doing fine. But all those bands that are kind of like up and coming that are kind of big, but not quite big, they can't tour. No. And they got to be hurting. I mean, music, probably uh-huh. 90%, maybe 95% of all prof- professional, right? Not just musicians right. who play, but professional musicians 95 percent of them is what my guess is have to be hurting they're going to be hurting really really bad where are they and getting their money yeah. and it's so hard too because what do we turn to in our times of sorrow in our times when we're afraid we turn to the arts many times yeah but those very people that we turn to it's dangerous to be with all it's, it's dangerous for us all to be together right now yeah. um in the way that we were used to I remember I had a we had my husband and I had tickets to see uh, Brittany Howard in concert. She um, uh, she has a, a, a she was with Alabama Shakes, of course, and then she um, has her own. Yes, yeah, they're love awesome. Alabama. I love Alabama That's Shakes. Amazing, yes. And so Brittany, the the lead singer, she also has her own single pro, um, individual pro, projects. And I had just purchased tickets to see her here at the Fillmore in Charlotte, and um, the concert was it was like the highlight of my. I had two things I wanted to take place. Well, three that I wanted to take place in April. One was um, I was hosting a table at the um, domestic uh, violence, or, you know, people against domestic violence, um, the yep. Jamie Kimmel Foundation for that. Also, I was going to go to the World Voice. Um, there was a big, big thing at uh, at Duke that they have this big World Voice uh, conference. And then seeing Brittany Howard was going to cap off my 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 um, April just to see her and see the energy and the magic in her voice and hear that magic. And love her, canceled. love her. Oh my God! And then to see so many other concerts canceled, it's where we get our it's where we get our nourishment through music. Um, you play um, the strings are instruments of healing for a lot of people. Um, and then to not be able to be, yeah, I can pull you up and listen to you, and it's wonderful. I can pull up my artists, and it's still wonderful. They they've got bodies of work, but there's still something about that intimate environment, whether it's a big concert where you can see other people sweating it out with you. Or what you know, and man, I, I I miss it. I miss it so much, and I and I hate it for the the artists that can't do what it is that they were sent here to do right now. You know, but they're 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 doing everything they can to help. They're still doing concerts online because they can't be contained. You can't contain an expressive creative. You just right, <laughs> right. So, do you think being a vocal coach, do you feel like right now they're working on writing songs? Because five years from now, we're going to look back and say, wow, that. That two-year period or a year and a half or however long it lasts, um, a lot of creativity came out. Do you think that's what they should be doing? They should be digging deep and, and creating? Absolutely. I think that we take everything that comes our way and it goes into our medicine. I had a um, client ask me last week, she said, do you think that we'll ever be able to go and do live theater again? And What is your prognosis and all of that? And I said, well, right now, what what we should be doing is creating, even in this, if you can. I know that there are people who are depressed. I know there are people who are anxious. And so I don't ever like to push anybody past what they need to deal with and process. So I'm not saying, you know, if you're not creating, you're, you know, you're a loser and you need to get out. You're not really a creative if you're not creating. I'm just telling them if it it lies within you in the moment and you can muster the energy to do so, uh, because we will be on the other side of, of this at some point. And mm-hmm. there will be some stuff that's come out of this. Um, and I, I think that this is the time that you have um, to, to make your medicine right now. And then also, I think it's the time to become more tech savvy um, because this was dropped all on all of us like a big old hot potato. We were just like, what? This came from out of nowhere. Right, and right. 
people who are recovering a little bit more quickly are those ones that are tech savvy. They're able to set up that Skype or that Zoom concert, um, you know, little things like that. You know, go ahead now and treat it like a pandemic is going to be here forever or treat it like it's going to go away, but it could happen again at any moment. And that way you can get, be kind of a little bit more, you know, ready for it. No one could have been ready for this or predicted it. But now that it's happened, it, it can be it could happen again, you know. <laughs> right, right. So if you're just tuning in right now, my guest is Tiffany Moore Borgelin from Pure Voice Podcast. She's awesome. Subscribe to her podcast. Go to iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, wherever you want to go. I What, iHeartRadio? It's all over the place. You just dropped your last episode today, but it's not going to come out till a few days from now. But go ahead and follow her and uh, you'll see the last episode. She is a holistic voice coach. She works with the artists that you love to listen to, and, and uh, you love their voice, and she helps them to really dig deep and to find their uh, purpose. So, uh, Tiffany, it's great having you on the show. It's great. Being, it's, it's been awesome, Dave. <laughs> so what's been your favorite podcast so far? Because you've got a podcast show. We're talking about that. What's been your favorite one so far? Um, you know what? I think it's the get in where you fit in um, because I was able to tell a little bit about my past. And even though it was painful, it was necessary um, with regard to a lot of the racial unrest that we have going on here in, in the United States. And um, I think because I was able to tell the story of how I one time myself had to actually physically get into a physical altercation with a person who was outright racist and torturous towards me. And a lot of people who know me, you know, you know me, I'm not one to take mess off of anybody. But as you get older, you don't come to blows with people as quickly. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I grew, I evolved. Um, there's only a few things right now that I would go to blows over, you know, the life of my child, you know, defending myself, those types of things. Sure. But, but I, I had to tell the story of how when you get to that place where you're just tired and I didn't know that I was going to really be able to tell it. And I didn't know what type of light it would paint me in because I actually physically fought a person. But I think being able to tell it from my heart made it more understandable. And then being able to tell it from the standpoint of this person was just, you know, torturously racist towards me. And I had to put a stop to it. And the only way to do it at that point was to let them know I'm not the one. Like, I'm not the one. But to also be able to tell the story that came from the compassion of other people um, who looked like her, not like me, who were, who were white people, who themselves were fed up with that type of thing. Um, and then to tell people that you too can... I always tell people, if this makes sense, if, because I'm, in, I'm a coach also, like I said, for the, the African, American, African American Theater Company, and when I do the curtain speech, I always say... Um, the black experience in America does not just belong to black people. If you live in these United States, then you are a part of that experience. You you decide which part you want to play. You decide which role you want to play. So that was a very personal, especially growing up in the South as, as an African-American woman who many times had to fight. Like, I, you know, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina in a little community where it just was so prevalent that it was part of our regular day, you know, being called out of your name, being challenged. Um, and then to be triggered with all that's taken place in these last few months and that even is still happening, I didn't know if I'd be able to fully tell that story. Um, and it brought a lot out of me, but I believe it helped a lot of people because I've had people of different races. I had one person call me just crying uncontrollably and saying, you told my story. Um, and then I have had the, uh, you know, I won't call it a privilege. I've had the the, this phenomenon of talking to a person who is uh, Caucasian or who, who's white, um, who themselves through tears said, you know, wow, like just to, to hear the emotion of the, of the whole experience. Because I think at the end of the day, I had to give voice to it. I had to do the very thing that I encourage everyone else to do. Give voice to it, recognize it, process it, um, heal yourself, and then, in the, and then simultaneously help your fellow. Mm-hmm favorite uh, podcast episode thus far um, because I think it helped a lot of people um, to reconcile the emotions that take place during our 
racist provocations, if that's the word, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. Wow. Oh, man, America. Did you imagine America would be the way we are right now, just even a year ago? No, um, never. Um, I, I, have, I am not a person who walks around with rose-colored glasses on, so I know that there are things that have always been here. I have been traumatized over the course of my life, not just through things that have happened racially, but just other things in my life. So those things don't go away. Um, and I've, I've watched things unfold from, you know, I think Tray, Trayvon Martin. and You know, you hope and you pray, if that's, your, if that's your game, if that's your thing to pray or what have you. And you, let me say this. I think this is, I'm going to come from the raw part of what I know right now, Dave. We were going through this pandemic. And... It's all right. I stood. Take your time. Take your time. When they first told us about getting hand sanitizer, I was in line at Rite Aid, and there was a white lady who was probably about my same age, and we both had anxiety in our eyes because we didn't know what was going on. And we bought the last of the little bit of hand sanitizer that was left, and we split it. I mean, we were looking at each other like, and we, met, we didn't say too many words to each other. We just, in that moment, she was a human being and I was a human being. And it was like, yo, what's going on? Let's, let's, let's you know, and, and we understood each other. The, we, had, we both had, anx, we were both anxious in that moment. And I was like, boy, this pandemic reduces everyone to the most human aspect of who they are. When was like, this? This was, not a, this was literally probably like really at the end of March when things started to really jump off. No, probably at the beginning of March when we first right. heard about like, by hand sanitizer and stuff like that. And so I left out of there and I told my husband, I said, you know, in that moment, you didn't have a black woman and a white woman. You had two human people, women, who who, who on any given day could have been out having a glass of wine together or what happened. Right, come on, we both, come on. We were both terrified in that moment. And I said, I think this is going to help everyone to see that we are all susceptible to something that's bigger than us. And maybe it will humanize for those who don't see people that are different than them as human, and there maybe it will call up, you know. And then you had the news show you this person with his knee on the neck of another person in the midst of all of this. And all I could think in that moment was, even during a pandemic, we still have people, certain individuals, who can't see other people as human. We're all trying to get through something here. And I think that's where my pain and my ang my ang 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 anxiety and angst came from. It's like, even during a pandemic, when we should all be taking each other in and helping each other and saying, you know what, forget that mess, forget that Confederacy mess, because let's just be human and help each other get through this. We still had division and we still had all of this. And I think it, it disheartened me. And so no, a year ago, if you would have told me that we would have been in a worldwide pandemic that was equalizing a lot of people, and yet we were still having to fight just to say, you know, I too am a man, you know, uh, I can't breathe or what have you. Um, and when you have, when I have my white friends, because I, my white friends are ride or die, like they'll, they'll tag you before I will, they'll let you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> when we, they're even just like, I don't understand it. I don't get it. You know, I don't get it. Um, that's when I knew I was like, this is something like we've never seen before. And it all is being compounded right now. What I choose to believe is even though last year at this time, I didn't see myself or see us like this. I, I have, I have to cling to hope that this year or next year at this time, there, something will heal. Something will, will break open and we'll be able to try to at least try to process to the next step. I, I've got to believe that because if I don't, what, what else do we have at this point? Hope and working to, toward it mm. together, you know? You know, Tiffany, you got a beautiful heart. And um, I appreciate your tears. And um, I appreciate you just being open like that. Uh, it's true. Humanity, 
humanity is more important than race and color and all that. Um, that that's yeah, it's just amazing. It's amazing where we are right now as a human race, not just Americans. Well, yeah, as Americans, because you know what? It's not happening in other countries. Other countries are looking at us, and they're they're a little shocked. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, yeah. They're shocked, but uh, I have another show called The Gray, where the blacks, you know, when you we talked earlier about color psychology, when you mix black with white, this is kind of like, duh, you get gray. <laughs> So I, I named the show The Gray. Uh, it's me and Jeremy, who's black and I'm white. Together, it's awesome. The Gray. And it's great. You should check it out. Um, but a uh, little plug. I will. And it's great. We talk about racism, <laughs> race issues. And um, it's, man, the and you know, I think a lot of white people, a lot of white people, are getting kind of tired of the whole thing, like, oh my God, slavery was so long ago, and da, da. but no, it's so it's so in our system right now, like right now, it's happening every single day, and I didn't know it, I was clueless to it, so I know we're way off topic, way off topic, but uh, I appreciate your heart, and I appreciate that you feel things for the creative people. But I appreciate that you also feel things for where the society is at right now. And man, I, I, I wish you the best, the absolute best of luck. Uh, the, the creative the creative individual needs you right now. They need to know that there's a coach out there that can help you. And if you're listening tonight and you are a singer or a poet or someone that has a voice, please, please, please... I beg you to follow her show, Tiffany Moore Borgelin, Pure Voice Podcast. Uh, we're going a little over, but that's fine. We, we can go. We don't have to cut to commercial. That's not what we do. So uh, thank you so much, Tiffany, for coming on the show. But I do want to end with another question. Any upcoming projects? Um, right now, uh, the show that I put out today was the end of season one for Pure Voice Podcast, so you have yes. a whole trove of, yeah, I, we did season one, and so you have a whole trove, about 14 shows you can go and catch up on. I'll be back in October um, to begin season two, um, and then I'm also working on a book um, that's going Come on. to, yeah, it's bringing together some of the uh, the things that I talk about, but uh, it, it, it addresses uh, some of the things, uh, boundaries, uh, self-awareness, self-love, um, all the things that I talk about on the podcast, um, but but that's that's kind of in the works. It won't really be ready probably until like the beginning of next year, not the beginning of next year, but if, when the spring is over, right at the beginning of next summer. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the goal. With that so that's the main thing. And then, the, but the main project is just to continue to polish, uh, you know, Pure Voice podcast and continue to work with my clients and uh, do the best that I can because the the more people that uh, allow me and give me the privilege. Uh, to have them under the sound of my voice, uh, the more I feel like I am doing what I've been sent here to do, and that is to help other people do what they've been sent here to do. So, yeah. <laughs> right. There you go. That's awesome. Uh, listen, thank you so much for coming on the show. It is 10.08 on the East Coast. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And, uh, Tiffany, you've been awesome. I feel like I have a friend for life. And uh, we will connect. Stay on Skype because I want to talk to you right after I close out my last five minutes here. So just stay okay. there. Don't leave. Uh, okay. And, all right. Awesome. Let me go to the next scene here. All right. That was great. Tiffany was awesome. Guys, I want you to follow her. Go to iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, wherever you, wherever you find your podcast. And um, follow her. Pure Voice Podcast. I've been listening to a few of her episodes and they're really inspiring. I got to get some time to kind of get out there and um, sit in my car, <laughs> as it were, and listen to some episodes. So go ahead and follow her. That's the whole goal of this show, right? I mean, I set it up April 1st, supporting local talent. So just do it. Um, I have a closing joke before we end. It is 10.09 
And, uh, yeah, I got a closing joke. It's always good to end on a joke. But before I say the joke, I do want to say something that I typically say at the end of every episode. Uh, Everyone has an expiration date. You know, when you go to the stop and shop or wherever you go, Piggly Wigglies, wherever you go, and you pick up the milk, there's an expiration date. You want to make sure that you got one that's pretty fresh. I want you to think of human beings that way. Some of them are really fresh, and they're, they're going to be around for a while, just like a gallon of milk. And some of them, and I remember doing this when I went to a stoop, uh, stop and shop once, grabbed a g- gallon of milk, and it was really, you know, you should consume this by, and it said the date, and the date was today. I put it back. And I want you to think of human beings that way, that there are some human beings that they're not going to be around for very long. They may leave this planet in a couple months. I want you to really think about that. And I like to end with that, uh, my little inspiration of the night, if you will. Uh, Everyone has an expiration And I want you to think of everybody as the expiration date. So, uh, anyway, that was my little little emotional tag there. I've got a closing joke. Here's my joke. Why did the can crusher, okay? Because there is a job called can crushers. Why did the can crusher quit his job? Because it was soda pressing. <laughs> it was so depressing. See you guys in two weeks. <laughs>